Hey everybody, it's Romania Black and we are on chapters 74 through 76 of Heaven Officials Blessing. And uh, yeah, I'm, I have procrastinated on this, uh, on this set of chapters for all week. <laughs> it's uh, Sunday night. Um, it's supposed to come out on Patreon tomorrow morning. <laughs> But I had several reasons why I procrastinated. One, uh, because I was waiting for chapter 87 of the Manwa to come out and it has been delayed. So sad days. Um, there's been a variety of reasons. I'm sure some of you will comment down below. Uh, the ones that Discord have provided that the Billy Billy app is going through some changes. So they said there would be delays. There's also only three chapters left of the Manwa. So it's been coming out in Chinese, but the English translations just aren't out yet. So I, that gives me courage that it will, an encouragement that it will come out. It's just a matter of time. So, so that's exciting. I am, I'm excited to know that I will get to be able to read those chapters, but they're just going to come out. So I think what I'm going to do each week is just wait till around Wednesday. That will give me time for, to see people's comments, things like that. And then if the chapter, the last three Manwa chapters as they come out, if we have to wait a little bit on them, then that's fine. So no Manwa chapter this week. Hopefully it'll be out for next week, um, so that will be fine. Uh, I'm only reading two chapters next week. I already decided to do that because the, the following set is like a giant chunk. So I just, next week might be a little bit shorter than usual. So hopefully we'll have chapter 87 out by then to talk about it as well. But uh, this, this set of chapters, 74 through 76, um, the other reason I've waited a long time is I've caught a bug. <laughs> Uh, this morning, I, I'll be honest, y'all, it is like 7 o'clock at night right now. Uh, at 6 a.m. this morning, I felt like garbage. I don't know. I don't think it's the flu, but it's some kind of bug. But I like TMI. I like vomited for a good solid four hours. Like my stomach is, my, my stomach muscles are cramped because I threw up so much. It was like, ugh. And I finally, I just slept all day. I slept till like 5 p.m., all day and I don't know what it is. It doesn't feel like the flu, but it feels like a bug. I'm just very sore and just mm, not not feeling great. It's just probably like a stomach bug going around that's gross. But I feel a lot better now and I was like, I wanted to read the chapters because I've waited all weekend to do so. And so I wanted to read them. I wanted to read them today and so I do feel a lot better. But if my energy wanes or I'm like, uh, or I'm like sore, that is, that is why. But I'm not going to let that deter me from MXTX and this amazing story. I'm just going to treat this as a cure-all to make me feel better. Although the content right now is not really one that makes you feel better because even though we have Hua Chong being like a little Hong Hong air, being so supportive of Shi Lian and Shi Lian offering him that adorable praise at the end of chapter 73. Um, things are not looking good. Things are bad. Xian Li looks like they're on the downfall. We haven't even touched the white calamity yet. Um, things are not looking good. And I have some comments that I want to talk about, several comments before we start, that kind of help to reiterate that things are not going well and that Shi Lian's like tragic story is just beginning, right? So um, I do make note that intellectuals intellectuals talked about how um, I mentioned in the last set of chapters or the one before it that I wasn't sure what the the zodiac signs or the horoscope signs for Shilian and Hua Chong were. Hua Chong's a Gemini, surprising no one, <laughs> and Shilian is a Cancer. And I was like, okay, that that seems to fit very well. And they made note um, that in Modao Zushi, uh, I think Wei Wuxian is a Scorpio and. I think Lan Wanji is an Aquarius, which totally fits. And they're very compatible. They're like soulmate compatibility. And I'm like, okay, makes sense. But Gemini and Cancer supposedly are not very compatible. And I'm like, well, against all odds, they're going to be, right? I feel like that's part of the story is that Shi Lian and Hua Chong are against all odds, the, the one couple that makes it work. So I thought that was very curious. But yeah, Hua Chong being a Gemini, mm -hmm. Makes sense, which is kind of funny. I'm a Taurus, but I have most of my friends are Gemini, Cancers, or Virgos, <laughs> and so and Aquarius. So I was like, hmm, no wonder I like Hua Chong and Shilian so much. <laughs> but I thought that was really cool. Um, Juliet, Juliet asked this really cool question, and I wanted to bring it up. Juliet in their comments said, "Did you think that we would have so much information about Chi Rong in this story?" No, 
I didn't. I honestly thought Chi Rong would be a villain that would be kind of like, I thought Chi Rong would be like the surface villain that we just see for like a volume and he'd be like the first calamity we'd defeat and then we'd move on to the other ones. I had no clue going into the story that he would one, be tied to Xilin by blood, but that two, his whole being would be so integral to the story so far. No clue. I thought he was just gonna be like a one and done calamity, like the first one we get through and it's like, now we're gonna move on to the other two bigger calamities in Hua Chong. But no, he's like got a, he's got a lot of depth to him and we've talked a lot about him in this story. So yeah, I would not have predicted that. It's been like one of the biggest surprises how much we're getting on Chi Rong in this story. And I like it. Uh, the Miss Nadia talked about how Chi Rong, Chi Rong probably couldn't take the throne. And I, I told, I've said this in the comments, I don't really want to be confirmed or deconfirmed about Chi Rong. I don't really want to know anything about who would take the throne and who wouldn't until we cross that threshold in the story. Because I feel like if we talk too much about it now, I won't be able to theorize about it because I'll run out of options. You'll be like, no, that won't work. No, that won't work. And I'm like, well, then what are my options? So, and we'll talk about it with another comment later down, but, but that Chi Rong, I mean, I've said this in the discussion. I don't think Chi Rong is likely to take the throne because of his mom and his illegitimacy, but we don't know. So let me theorize. <laughs> But they did talk about how there's a Chinese phrase that I was like, Eeks. that is daughters married away are like water spilled away. I'm like, wow, that's okay. <laughs> Can't say we don't have phrases like that in the US, but I was like, yikes. <laughs> but what can you do? It's the past. So I thought that was interesting. But also, the, apparently the I am your granddaddy phrase that is absolutely ridiculous that Chi Rong utters is actually a pretty common Chinese phrase that is meant to assert dominance, being like, who's your daddy sort of thing. And I'm like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So thank you for that. Um, Paula talks about how MXTX's commentary on the rich and the poor is very universal. And I'm like, yes, that is one of the things I love about this volume so far is that MXTX is talking about very, it's, it's like the trolley problem on steroids. Like what do we do in these situations and shows how complicated they are and that they're not easy to solve. And that oftentimes there's no good solution. And the sad thing is that I think anywhere in the world, like whether you're in China, whether in the U S whether you're somewhere else, it's the saddest thing, but there is this disparate disparity between the rich and the poor and a lot of times the government officials don't do much about it. And so it's like, well, it's very relatable and it's very real. And I like the fact that MXTX talks about it in kind of this fantasy element so that it doesn't seem so on the nose, but we, the audience are like, yep, we know where you're coming from. And it's, it's fascinating. So I'm glad you brought that up, Paula. Um, SQQLBH314 brought up a really good thing too about how the Earth Master, you know, the, Ra well, the Rain Master, I talked about in the last discussion, how the Rain Master, they can't just take water out of nowhere. They have to go get it from somewhere else. But SQQLBH kind of pointed out too that the Rain Master, we don't really know what they're going to be capable of because the Earth Master could control the Earth, but they couldn't escape Hua Chong interrogating them. They couldn't use the Earth as an escape method. And I'm like, that's a pretty good point. Also, though, it is Hua Chong, so there's no telling what Hua Chong put in place. And we still don't know about the Waning Moon Officer to know what their powers were and or are. So there's a lot of factors with the Earth Master in that situation, but that is a cool observation that, yeah, the Earth Master couldn't exactly use their powers in certain extents, so maybe the Rain Master will or won't be an asset. We don't know. I'm assuming maybe we'll find out in this set of chapters. We'll see. Um, so that might be interesting. But also, I liked SQQ LBH talking about how you have functions rationale that, well, the mortals should just figure it out themselves. We should be standoffish and the heavenly officials should have nothing to do with the situation. You have Mu Ching, who's like, well, only certain people are deserving of prayers over others. And then you have Xi Lian's view that everyone needs to be saved. All lives are equal. The heavenly officials seem to kind of really gravitate towards the same moralities as Feng Shen and Mu Ching, which is why they're doing so well in the heavenly realm and Xi Lian's the one that's kicked out. So I thought that was a really cool thing to bring up. I'm like, yep, interesting indeed. A ghostly turnip talked about how Shi Lian, this is really important too. Shi Lian's always been a prodigy. Shi Lian's been great at everything they've done since day one. 
Everything Shelian's picked up, he's managed to be really good at it, with the exception of cooking. <laughs> but he's never had to cook before because he's a prince. So that part we don't know yet. But so far in his life, everything Shelian has done, he's been amazing at. So when Shelian is for the first time faced with the fact that he can't do anything and that all of his talents are useless, he doesn't know what to do. And he's like, well... Well, what am I supposed to do then? And so it's really interesting to note, of course, now that I think about him, like he is terrible at cooking. So maybe that's going to come out later on, which is kind of hilarious. But yeah, yeah, poor Shelian, he's been faced with a, he's been a big fish in a little pond all of his life. He's like the down home hero. He's like the, the, the hometown hero that can do no wrong. And then he goes out into the big world and realizes, oh crap, there are things I can't do. And it's really problematic, right? So anyway... Uh, and then Millipop. Millipop talked about how Hua Chong has a habit of turning heavenly officials into dolls. And I was like, ah! Because Hua Chong has like the little the little shrine of Xilin. He's like the chubby little doll. And it doesn't look too unlike the Daruma doll that he makes Luan Chan Chu into. So it's like, it's cute that Huan Chong's his thing is like, I'll just make you into a doll. <laughs> like that, that's his go-to, right? I think that's really cute. And then Anime Annie talks about how, yeah, Xilin, he didn't break the rules for his parents. Didn't bring Shi wrong. Didn't break bring him for the people. But Hua Chong, he broke the rules for Hua Chong. And I, here's my thing. Do I think that Jun Wu knows that Hua Chong was Hong Hong heir? I don't. But I think that it's rather curious that he tells Shi Lian to be careful around Hua Chong. It would be very interesting if Jun Wu did know that they were connected and was like, oh crap, Shi Lian broke the rules for Hong Hong. Now he's an adult ghost. He's, he'll probably break the rules again for him. So, ah. but then again, we don't, the, the thing about Hua Chong is nobody knows his past. Nobody knows that he was Hong Hong heir. So, so I don't think Jun Wu knows that Hua Chong is Hong Hong heir, but it would be amazing if he did, because it's kind of curious. He's, he's giving this advice to Xilian not to mess with him, which is connected to the fact that Xilian has only broken the rules for Hua Chong in the past. Would he do them again? We'll see, eh? And then finally, uh, Sarah Linda talked about how Shi Lian, how the kingdom of Shanla has not made any preparations for the throne yet. And that kind of ties to the Miss Nadia. Although, something that's curious about this that Sarah Linda kind of pointed out was that if the Goshi and the king know that Shanla is on the downward spiral, maybe they're taking precedence over thinking about it instead of finding an heir. They're like, we really don't have time to find an heir because our kingdom is in a lot of danger. And now is not the time to be bringing someone new into the fold to handle this crisis that's about to erupt and boil over. We need to try to deal with it first. And if we make it, if we somehow make it past the crisis, then we can focus on an heir. But right now, we don't have time to do that. So I thought that was rather interesting. But yeah, I, I feel better today. I feel a lot better this evening than I did <laughs> miles better than I did this morning. This morning was pretty rough. And I've got some tea here that will hopefully help. But, oh my God, y'all. I am pretty excited to dive into chapter 74 through 76 and see what's up. But we'll we'll see oh, what what could happen in this chapter. We just, you know, at that, that chapter ended so wholesome with Shi Lian and Hua Chong. Nothing bad's going to happen, right? Nah, 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 nah. So I will probably, just for the sake of pacing myself, take a break in between each chapter to take notes. Uh, last, last set of chapters, I just rolled right through. I was like, can't stop, won't stop. This set, I'll probably take a break and just take some notes before moving on. Just for my own sanity. <laughs> so, but I'm excited, y'all. I hope you all are too. But we're going to start chapter 74 through 76 of Heaven Officials Blessing. And we're going to do that here in three, two, one. And let's go. Chapter 74, Praying for Rain. The Rain Master lends the rain hat. The rain hat. Okay. But we got to go with this with, she, with um, Hua Chong first. <laughs> Function and Mu Ching wish they could grow several more arms and legs to smother Shi Lian. They finally pulled him down. But Shi Lian effortlessly pushed him away and said, all right, I'm done. I know I violated the rules, but you just pretend you've heard nothing and all will be well. As long as you guys don't say anything, no one will know. Just this once. Don't say anything, you hear me? 
Mu Ching looked like he'd been forced to eat a sock and shook his head, muttering, I can't believe you. Saying something like, live on for me with such confidence. You really... Xi Lian didn't know what he said was much of anything. But hearing Mu Ching, now it sounded like it was quite the something indeed. And he flushed a bright red color. And Feng Shen immediately frowned. Frowned. Enough. His highness is already... His highness already said not to speak of it, so why are you still talking about it? Yet the corners of his lips were twisted. Oh, so they think they're like, oh, you're going to you tell live for him, huh? This little kid, huh? And Shilin's like, no. Oh, you, what, what, what I said clearly worked. Look. The young boy sat dazedly for a long while. But when no more of Shilin's voice came, he rubbed hard at his face, reached for the offering plate on the altar, held it in his hands, and started munching at the dried out fruits and refreshments. He chewed and chewed vigorously, looking like a small animal, both vicious and pitiful. Shilian bent down to watch him, a smile appearing on your face. You see, it worked. He refused to eat before, but now he's eating. All right, fine, it works because you're a god. All right, right, it works because you're a god. That's right, I am a god. I called you both over because I've indeed come to a decision. And the atmosphere turned heavy again. So yeah, so that that whole thing of back when Shilin was imagining the boy eating at the altar, that was this scene here where he imagined the boy stuffing the food down. That was the same thing. Ah! What do you want us to do? Are we minding this matter? We are. It's simple. There's not enough water in the kingdom of Shanla, so we're going to go to kingdoms outside of Shanla. Go to the other kingdoms? Wouldn't that be too far? We'd need to borrow, borrow water, creating spiritual devices from some water god and impose ourselves in the territories of other heavenly officials that might not be willing. They might not be willing. I'm going to give it a shot. It's still better than doing nothing. You two stay and continue to watch over Yangin. Assist the worst affected areas and I will return to the heavenly court. Any problems? Function says, no problems. I've got your back. And Muqing gave it some thought. Then what about all the prayers from the devotees at the temple of the crown prince? I was going to get to that. Pick out the important ones and take care of them for me. The not so dire ones can wait. Okay, Mu Ching didn't look too optimistic, but he still acknowledged, You're the crown prince, we'll listen to you, but I advise not to let them wait too long. And of course, Shilian pats their shoulders, and he left, and they departed, leaving Shilian and the child in the small shrine. Oof. Initially, he was going to pay a visit to heavenly officials that controlled water, but strangely, a number of them were away from the heavenly court, and only the rainmaster, who didn't reside in the heavens, was around. Well, that's weird. Well, okay. Okay. Hmm. He was turning down the streets and bumped into a black-clad woman. Oh, is that... Oh, is that Lin Wing? Oh, your highness, you're finally back. Oh, Nangong. Oh, so this is Lin Wing's predecessor. Nangong, you've come in the nick of time. Do you know where the Rainmaster's residence is located? The black-clad woman was named Nang Nangong Ji. She was a low-ranking civil official from the middle court. Okay. After he had ascended, much of the grunt work and errands were taken care of by her. This individual is well informed of news and handle affairs well. So Shilian thought well of her. That's why he likes Ling Wen so much, because he, he relates the two of them together. Okay. The Lord Rainmaster's new palace hasn't finished construction yet, so the current residence is temporarily situated in the kingdom of Yushi in the south. Hmm. Why are you looking for the Rainmaster? It's for urgent business. Thanks for your help. Gee, John, yeah, now you're going to get people questioning. No. Nangong, you're more familiar with the heavenly officials of the upper court. Can you tell me if the Lord Rainmaster likes anything? Oh my God, he's going to try to bribe him? No. Okay, the clever ones will pay a visit to all the palaces of every official and greet them with gifts as a form of social salutation. Shilian ascended too suddenly, and when he first arrived, no one taught him. It was only afterwards that the Goshi reminded him, but by then it was already too late, and things would have been awkward. Ah. Also, something like this felt too much like backhanded bribery, and as the crown prince, Shilian didn't appreciate the practice. In the end, decided just to go about things naturally and hope for a chance to build relationships with the other officials through more genuine means. Hmm... It was an admirable act, but now they turned back on it. Now he turned back on it and proactively asked what a heavenly official would like. It sounded quite obvious that he was about to bribe someone. 
and he blushed with shame, but he had no choice. The Rainmaster was involved in none of these interactions, so for a first visit, Shelian didn't want people to misunderstand that he'd been borrowing spiritual devices for nothing. Regrettably, Nongong says, I'm afraid I can't help your highness in this. The Lord Rainmaster is quite low key. Not just me, but there's probably no one in the entire heavenly realm who knows this Lord's personal interests. Sorry. Oh, they sound like a hermit. Cool. Mm, oh, no worries. But if my Lord has anything in the matter, it won't hurt to pay a visit directly. By Lord Rainmaster's temper, you might still very well be received. Okay. And he arrived at the temporary residence of the Rainmaster. It was a small village, the mountains green and waters clear, a land of picturesque scenery, but Shelian had no mind to appreciate it. He crossed to the ridges of the fields and finally saw a stone slate with the word rain engraved on it. This meant that after passing the stone slate, it would be the temporary domain of the Rainmaster. Oh, so I'm going through a force field and then you're in their domain. Okay. Um... And those working within it should be his subordinates. But as Shillian walked, it was only lush green fields all around. The field In the fields were oxen mooing, mills turning, assiduous farmers planting rice, and next to the fields was a small crooked thatched cottage. There was neither trace nor signs of divinity, and Shillian wondered if he'd gone in the wrong direction. Wasn't this only an impoverished small farming village? While he was doubting himself, a small black ox from a field rather far away suddenly mooed twice, it stood back on its hind legs, its forelegs stretched, and it helped itself to remove a plow from its own back. That strong and solid body narrowed, and the long oxen snout shrank, and within a blink of an eye, it transformed into a bare-backed farmer from a buff black ox. Oh! Okay! The farmer was tall and strong, and his muscles well-defined, his expression stubborn. His nose had a steel nose ring hooked through it like that of an ox and a long weed hung from his lips. The other farmers witnessed this extraordinary transformation, but continued to work like it was nothing, so they are the subordinates. Shilin concluded that, there, that no one there was mortal, and approached raising his hands and folding them into a plight fist. Fellow cultivator, may I inquire if this is the temporary residence of the Lord Rainmaster? Hmm, yes, the Lord Rainmaster lives here. Okay. Even his most shabby, decrepit shrines looked more solid than this little cottage. Shilin was full of wonder. They said the Lord Rainmaster was of royal descent like himself, from the kingdom of Yushi. It was for this very reason that he didn't bring any precious gems or rare treasures as a greeting gift, thinking that the Rainmaster felt the same way he did in regards to these things, which was disdain. Why such dis destitution after ascension? Maybe it was another form of cultivation. Or, I wonder if Shilin's going to get inspired by him afterwards. Interesting, we're gonna talk about this when we discuss it. Without forgetting his manners, he thanked the farmer and approached the little college, calling with a loud, loud, clear voice. Lord Rainmaster, please forgive this Prince of Shanla for making this abrupt visit without prior notice. There was no response from the college and the farmer came forward hauling the plow. He's the Rainmaster. Oh, you're that crown prince who ascended at the age of 17. Regrettably. Oh, it's nothing regrettable, it's the truth. But the Lord Rainmaster doesn't like meeting people and was injured recently. So I'm afraid you won't be received today. Then may I ask you to pass on a message for me? I have an urgent request. However, if the Lord Rainmaster should feel inconvenienced by it, I won't push. <laughs> no need to pass on word. We all know why you're here. Feels bad, right? Having no water in Shanla. How do you know about this? Of course I know. It's not just here in this shoddy mountain ravine. At present, who doesn't know that catastrophe is about to befall your kingdom of Shanla? You don't know anything about your own affairs, but everyone else watching closely understands what's going on better than you yourself, and they're probably all enjoying the show. You're here to borrow the Rainmaster spiritual device for disaster aid, right? Those were enlightening words. It was only then that Shelian realized it wasn't that the heavenly officials were all gone at the same time. They had known what his intentions were and sh purposefully shut their doors or left a long time ago to avoid him, not wanting to get pulled into the mess. We've talked about this a little bit, but oh, hmm. should I really have paid everyone's palace a visit at the beginning? 
So it would have been easier to find cooperation. It wouldn't have mattered. It wouldn't have mattered, Shelian. It wouldn't have mattered a bit. But mm, it was a depressing thought. That's right. If it's inconvenient for the Rainmaster, I won't be bothersome. However, that farmer said, why not bothersome? Because it's shameful? This relates to the survival of your kingdom. Shouldn't you cause trouble and annoy us to death? Is it so hard to lower yourself a little? Young people shouldn't be so easily unnerved. Let me say something unpleasant. Should the Lord Rainmaster help, it's on account of kindness. If not, it's on account of duty. Lending the device to you would be based on mood. You can't complain after either. He knew that what he said made sense, but with such a dire situation at hand, plus his unfriendly tone, a wave of anger rolled up and he held his head higher, sounding grave. I understand everything you're saying, and I would never complain behind anyone's back, so why must you predetermine how I am? I said I wouldn't be bothersome simply because I don't want to do anything pointless and cause trouble for Lord Rainmaster at the time. But if the Lord Rainmaster doesn't feel inconvenienced, and I can borrow the spiritual device, so as long as I am bothersome, then it'd be nothing for me to pull up 8,000 of my temples and kowtow 100 times. Angry, the temper of a child. Here. He tossed something. He caught a verdant bamboo hat, the very one the farmer had on his back. What's this? A thing you wanted to borrow. The Lord Rainmaster already asked me to pass this to you before you came. Use it carefully. If you break it, we won't forgive you. Why? Didn't I already tell you why? Lending it to you was based on mood. Other heavenly officials won't help you, so the Lord Rainmaster just had to. Whatever the Lord Rainmaster wants to do, it shall be done. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Don't be too happy so soon, your highness. The Lord Rainmaster may have ascended before you, but there aren't as many devotees. Therefore, not as powerful as you. In addition, there are recent injuries to consider. Other than lending you that thing, the rest is all up to you. Distant waters cannot quench nearby thirst. They cannot put out nearby fires. The Rainmaster hat can move rain, but not create water. There's not enough water in your shanla, so you must borrow from other kingdoms, and they may not be willing. Only the kingdom of Yushi has an abundant collection over the years, and is rather wealthy in that aspect. Shilian was more than aware of just how difficult it was to lend your own spiritual device to a stranger. He bowed deeply to that thatched cottage. That the Lord Rainmaster would lend a helping hand, I am profoundly grateful. I will not forget this kindness. Should there be anything I can do to help in the future... Pray the Lord Rainmaster does not hesitate to ask me. Farewell. Oh, it was what, what was going to become of that? With the spiritual device in hand, Shilin immediately found a lake in the south and ladled a large quantity of lake water with the Rainmaster hat. He crossed thousands of miles and returned to Yongin and Shanla. He found the worst affected village, the Bay of Long Air, and flipped that bamboo hat from the clouds. Soon after, a small bout of rain fell from the sky. Shilin jumped up the clouds, landing them both feet on the ground. Those half-dead villagers could not believe their eyes. Some rushed out of the doors to cheer into the rain. Some hurriedly brought out buckets of all different sizes to collect water. Seeing this, Shilin breathed a sigh of relief, relief and finally revealed a smile. Just then he heard a voice from afar. Your Highness! Wu Ching appeared from the tree, his face dark. Shilin knew something was wrong. What? Did something happen? Why? Ching responsible for every cliffhanger in this damn story. What? Mu Ching, quit bringing all this darkness. <laughs> damn it. Well, okay. Th th there's some things I want to make note of before we move on. So uh, I'll make note of that first. Okay. So two things I've realized upon re upon rereading this. Uh, one is that. Uh, Nong Gong might actually be Ling Wen. <laughs> it might actually be her before she ascended because she says she was from the middle court. So Nong Gong could have been Ling Wen back when she was a civil servant before she ascended to be like an actual heavenly official in the upper court. Could be her. Could be the same one. So that, that's one thing. We'll talk more about it in the discussion. But also I realized that the, the hat that was given to Shi Lian, the bamboo hat, is kind of like the bamboo hat he wears now. So is it the same bamboo hat only it's like kind of broken and disheveled? Did he end up breaking the damn hat? We'll talk about this in the in the discussion, but I was like, oh, this is all. Or maybe Shilian gets a bamboo hat as a reminder of, you know, the hat that he had, but the, the one he took from the Rainmaster. 
Okay, but, but we've gotten to the end of chapter 75. So chapter 75, closing the capital gates, the survival of Yongin Bard. Well, shit. <laughs> oh, no. Your Highness, what took you so many days? Did I leave for very long? Traveling all over the heavens and earth, scooping lake water, mountain, cl mountain clouds and making rain, all without care for day or night. Shelian hadn't realized how much time had passed. It's been several days. Oh, the prayers from all the devotees have piled up into a mountain. Oh, well, didn't I tell you both to take care of the important ones first? The ones we can take care of have already been sorted, but there are too many prayers that we haven't the right to take over. That's why I asked your highness not to let them wait too long and hurry back. Mmm. And when he finished, the rain stopped at the same time. It lasted much shorter than he had expected. Oh. Shillian caught the, the bamboo cloud. But do you see the situation? I can't go away either. Your Highness, you were able to borrow the Rainmaster's spiritual device? Where'd the water come from? The kingdom of Yushi from the south. That far? How much power does that sap from you moving just water just once? And if every bout of rain is as small in size and quantity, if you keep this up, how will you manage to answer your followers' prayers? He knew. He was a martial god. And the devotees to the temple of the crown prince were his foundation, the source of his spiritual powers. What he was doing then was no different than abandoning his base. And if he wasn't careful, both sides would suffer. But what else could be done than what he was doing right now? I know, but if things go on like this and a riot breaks out in Yongin, the temple of the crown prince will be affected sooner or later. It's already breaking out. What? He rushed back to the capital. Just as he arrived at the Marshal Deity Avenue, there just so happened to be a band of royal guards, decked in full armor, sharp weapons in hand, walking over a group of detained, unkempt men with shackles on their hands and around their necks. Oh my god, the shackles too. Oh. Citizens crowded on both sides of the road, each full of rage. Feng Shin gripped his black bow, tense and ready, as if prepared for any sudden riots. Feng Shin, what are, where, who are these detainees? What crime did they commit? Where are they taking them? Your Highness, they're the people of Yongin. There were over ten men, all tall and gaunt, their skin slightly dark. Behind the soldiers trailed a few older men and a number of anxious women and children. The ones falling behind are two, they all are. Turns out, in the past several months, at the height of the drought in Yongin, many of the residents uprooted and escaped to the east in waves. When it was only tens of people, it wasn't obvious, but the flow was endless. And now there were more than 500 people. When 500 people gathered, it became quite a sight. Those people of Yongin were strangers to the land, had nothing to their names, and the moment they opened their mouths, their dialect would give them away. So when they arrived at the strange, bustling city, naturally they all stuck, out, stuck together for warmth. Thus, they looked all over the royal capital and finally found an uninhabited green field. Overjoyed, they built sheds and huts as temporary shelters. Unfortunately, although that green field was uninhabited, to those of the royal capital, it was a field of leisure. The people of Shanla had an indulgent culture, and those of the royal capital were leaders of that lifestyle. When free, many would take walks, dance, practice the art of the sword, sing poetry, paint, and gather at the green field. As for Yongin, sitting at the west of Shanla, they suffered an impoverished land and always had been poor, so the temper and culture of those citizens was completely opposite of the royal capital. Thus, those of the royal capital often believed themselves the pure of Shanla blood. And now with their land of elegance overtaken by a large number of refugees, cooking herbs, crying, doing laundry, starting fires, the stench of leftovers, and sweat filling the air, it made many nearby residents recoil with disgust, their complaints abundant. Some of the young and elderly leaders understood the situation in their hearts too and had wanted to move elsewhere. Yet the royal capital was already heavily populated. No matter where they went, it was full of people and there weren't anywhere else that they could settle that wasn't that didn't have so many, never mind all the wounded, sick, and children. It was easy to move, so they boldly and carefully clung on to that field. It wasn't easy to move. As much as the people of the royal capital were displeased, they were all still citizens of the same country. In light of the ongoing disaster, they tolerated the stranger's presence. Shelian listened to the report to this point when the band of soldiers brought those young and men to the mouth of the marketplace, shouting, Kneel! Each of those men looked angry and incredulous, but with sabers at their throat, they had no choice but to kneel. After the onlooking crowd of the royal capital saw the men kneeled in unison, some sighed, some were relieved. 
according to your report, both sides have intolerated each other. So what's going on today? Before they could answer, a woman shrieked into the crowd. You barbaric thieves, never mind your sticky fingers. Beating my husband like this, he can't even get up anymore. If anything happens to him, I'll have you pay. Don't you know to mind yourselves we're in other people's territory? Yeah, you're a guest in our homes, you crew, and yet you crudely steal. We already said it wasn't us who stole. We didn't throw the first punch either. We've got wounded on our side too. Stop talking. Feng Shen explained, a dog went missing in the royal capital. And because there was a case where a young child of Yongin stolen ate someone's duck from hunger, there were assumptions that the dog was stolen and eaten by those of Yongin too. A mob went to interrogate and a brawl started. A riot over just a dog? And they detained that many people? Yes, over a dog. It's gotten this big because both sides have been putting up with each other for too long. And anything small becomes big. So both sides swore the other started at first, and that it's the other's fault, and that this mess of a fight somehow grew bigger and bigger. Violent assemblies shall be severely punished. You're all shackled for a public demonstration. Any further crimes are forbidden. Many started chucking and throwing lettuce leaves and rotten eggs at those men of Yongin. The old men that trailed behind started bowing to the crowd all over, crying out, We apologize, everyone. We apologize. Please have mercy. Have mercy. Shilin thought this whole thing was making a mountain out of a molehill. Utterly ridiculous. But he could but he could also somewhat understand. So in the end, did they steal? Did they find the dog? Who knows? Who can find anything if bones were cleaned out and thrown away? But judging by their faces, I don't think they stole it. However, verdicts from the soldiers of the royal capital would naturally be partial to the royal capital citizens. Stolen or not, there was a brawl, and so the fault must lie from those of Yongin. Especially since the men of the royal capital loved to play around, but weren't as tough as the men of Yongin. This brawl must have ended in shame, creating more awkwardness between the two peoples. Shilin shook his head, gave the crowd a sweeping look, and suddenly noticed that in the row of Yongin men, there was a young man in the middle with his head drooped. His face looked familiar. It was the young man from the woods, Long Ying. How come I feel there have been more and more from Yongin in the royal capital in the recent months? And now they dare pick fights. No way, are they all coming over? Another merchant gestured his hands wildly. His majesty, the king, won't allow it. My house was robbed by Yongin thieves just the other day. If they all came over here, there'd be hell. Hearing this, Long Ying, who had kept his head low, letting all the groceries be freely thrown at him, suddenly looked up. Do you see it? Did you see it? What? Young and thieves robbing your house. Did you see them with your own eyes? I didn't see them with my own eyes, but it's always been peaceful before. And only after you all arrived was I robbed. So how does this have nothing to do with you? I see. I understand. Before we came, you guys were the ones stealing. And after we arrived, we became the thieves. Before he finished, a rotten persimmon came flying at him and smashed against the side of his lips, making him look as if he had vomited a large bloody blossom. The merchant bust out laughing and Long Ying's eyes dimmed. He closed his mouth and stopped talking. Xilian softened the sharp rocks being thrown at the young men, ensuring they wouldn't be severely injured. This public humiliation continued until evening, and only when the onlooking citizens gradually dispersed did the soldiers feel it was enough. Only then did they unlock the punished, etc., etc., the elders bowed deeply, repeatedly, repetitively with apologetic smiles, promising to never violate any more rules. However, Long Ying, lifeless, walked away by himself. Shilin watched his lone figure caught in the right moment and appeared in a flash from behind a tree blocking his path. The moment he appeared, the young man's eyes sharpened, and in that instant it was as if he was going to choke Shilin dead. A flash of a second later, after having seen clearly who it was before him, he tucked away the hand that was ready to attack. It's you. Shilin had transformed back into the form of that young cultivator. He was startled by Long Ying, whose hand almost attacked him. He thought to himself, this man is strong. He spoke up. I gave you that pearl, so why didn't you take it back to Yongin? The extended hand that held the pearl still had marks of those shackles. After some silence, Shilin didn't take it. Go back. The Bay of Long Air rain today. Tomorrow there will be rain again, I promise. It's for certain. It doesn't matter if it rains or not. There's no going back. And he only, Shilian only felt endless frustration. 
Before he ascended, it was like he had not a cloud of worry. Whatever he wanted to do, it would be done. Who knew that after ascension, all of a sudden, he would be surrounded by incessant worries, both worries of others and his own. Had it always been this hard to get something done? He had never felt so lacking, so powerless. He sighed and turned to leave too. There were a mountain of prayers waiting to be answered by him at the temple of the crown prince. Yet he wasn't the, only, wasn't the one with the most frustration. It was the king. The worry of the king of Shanla had become a reality. Those 500 some refugees of Yongan were only the beginning. With the borrowed rainmaster hat in hand, Shilian ran back and forth between the north and the south unceasingly and created rain by his own power. Yet every bout of rain would use up an immense amount of spiritual power and five to six days worth of time. If it wasn't him, there might not be another who could keep this up. Of course, with the exception of Jun Wu. However, the heavenly martial emperor ruled over a far greater land than he, and the number of devotees and domains to care for were significantly more than that of Shanla. So how could Sha Shilian possibly ask Jun Wu for help and distract him? Plus, he would not do it. But on top of that, each bout of rain could only wet a small area of Yongin, lasting but a short while. Even if there was some relief, it couldn't fix the root of the problem. Thus, after a month, the people of Yongin officially started to migrate to the east in droves. At first, it was only bands of ten-something people. Now it was hundreds, thousands, massive hordes that flocked together, streaming like a river. After another month, the king of Shangla announced a new decree. Due to the endless disputes and incessant conflicts of recent months, for the sake of peace within the royal capital, as of that day, all Yongans must leave the city. Everyone would be given a set amount of travel expenses to settle elsewhere. Before the massive teeming horde of migrating Yongin refugees, the grand gates of the royal capital of Shanla closed. I have a theory about Long Ying, but I'm going to save it for the discussion. Okay, so chapter 76, closing the capital gates, the survival of Yongin Bard 2. Oh, trigger warning, violence! Like, we've already had the, oh, that, is that the first time we've had a warning about the violence? Um, we've seen some pretty gruesome stuff in this series. What? What? Okay. Oh, open the gates, let us in. The soldiers backed into the fortress city and pushed the, shut the thousand-tonned gate. The people that had been expelled by the soldiers outside came rushing back towards it like a black water tide, slapping on the doors. Ooh, like the black water ghost? Hmm? On top of the towers, the soldiers roared, back away, leave, take your travel expenses and go eastward, don't stick around. But the refugees had turned their backs on their homelands, fled their lands, and arrived at the capital that was the closest in distance. The gates closed on them, but if they wanted to survive, they would be forced to go around the fortress city and walk an even further distance to the cities further east. The journey to the royal capital was already arduous and rough, crossing th through thousands of obstacles. Many were already wounded or dead, so how could they have any more energy to continue on? Even if they were all given travel expenses, ration, and water, how many more days could they hang on the road? Each of their faces were ashen, some dragging their household goods, some carried babies on their backs, some holding stretchers. They each held up. They held each other up, some lying on the ground, able to move anymore, and others simply sat. Fields and fields of them remained before the fortress walls. Some younger men still had the energy to be enraged, banging on the doors. You can't do this to us. You're going to kill us. We're all citizens of Shanla. You can't just kill us off like this. One of the men yelled until his voice was hoarse. You can kick us out. It doesn't matter. I won't stay, but you can at least take my, can you at least take my wife and children, please? They were like ants trying to shake a tree. The fortress city gates remained unmoved. Oh, I love that. She leaned at the top of the tower, his white robes fluttering in the wind as he crossed the parapet to watch below. Oh, what a visual, like him on top of the gates, like watching the people down below. Oh, oh. There were endless heads, black and squirming, dense and tightly knit, like swarms of ants he used to see when he played in the royal gardens in his younger years. Back then, out of curiosity, he'd looked closer and extended a finger, wanting to poke at them secretly. But there was immediately an attendant who cried out, Your Highness, those things are dirty. Don't touch them. Don't touch. With her dress lifted, she ran hurriedly and squashed all the ants under her foot. When those ants were alive, other than a dense swarm, there wasn't much to look at. After they'd been squashed in something less than mud piles, there wasn't anything left to look at. Within the royal capital walls, lights filled two millions of homes and sounds of music wafted in the air. 
this one fortress wall separated two completely different worlds. Never mind that the Ongan refugees who arrived after were kept out, even the ones who had already settled with within had been expelled. Although harsh, Shilian could somewhat understand that this was because there were more and more friction between the Ongan refugees and the royal capital residents in the recent months. To keep such men inside the city walls, there could very well have been collusion inside and out, causing havoc. However, just one thing he felt still had room for negotiation. He spoke out loudly, absentmindedly. Why must the women and the vulnerable be expelled too? There are some who can't walk much further. Muchin replied, if they must be expelled, then they must all be expelled. Everyone must be treated equally. There must be any favoritism, lest the people be provoked. How come they could stay? How come get, they could stay, not me? You think too much, Feng Shen commented. I like always tell him he thinks too much, right? Oh my gosh. There are very well people who could think like this. Besides, if the wives and children remain, then the men wouldn't want to go too far either. They would want to return sooner or later. Keeping people in the city is keeping future problems. And those young refugees refused to leave. Suit yourselves. Since the king made the command, did they think that just sitting there loitering would do anything? They could loiter for one or two days, but hardly a month or two, or a year or two. The soldiers and residents of the royal capital believed this. Some of the young refugees hopelessly accepted their fate and decided to gamble traveling eastward, but such numbers were few. Most still sat stubbornly at the fortress gates, hoping the royal capital would open their doors to them, or at the very least, give them somewhere to rest before journeying onwards. When new refugees arrived, although disappointed in seeing the closed city gates, when they saw so many still keeping watch, they joined the masses. And so they just keep sitting there over and over again. The limit was crossed on the fifth day. They used rations and water given by the king to hold on, but they were almost at their limit. So after five days, those past five days, Shelian had divided each day into three. One third devoted to the followers of the Temple of the Crown Prince, one third for moving water and creating rain, and one third for caring for the young and citizens outside of the city walls. Even with Feng Shen and Mu Qing helping, sometimes Shilian felt the weight of those responsibilities. The spirit was willing, but the flesh was weak. That day, it just so happened to be a time when he wasn't guarding outside the city walls. Under the scorching sun, there was a wail outside the gates. The wailing came from a couple holding their child in their arms. What's wrong with the child, hungry, thirsty? Everyone, come share some water here. This child's not looking too good. Oh. She sobbed as she fed water to her red-faced child, but the water was thrown back up. I don't know what's going on. He's sick. A doctor. We need a doctor. Open up. Someone, son, someone's dying. My son's dying. Naturally, the soldiers within didn't dare open the gates. Whether or not someone was actually dying, there were hundreds of thousands outside. If they opened up, there'd be no closing the gates. Instead, they'd reported, they reported to the officers higher up. The weather was hot, and the heat was making the soldiers standing watch over the past days cranky. Give him some food and water, they said apathetically. Thus, they used a rope, hung some water and food, and lowered it down. Thank you, thank you, my lords and brothers, but we don't want water or food. Can you help us find a doctor? This made things difficult. They could let him find a doctor, and they certainly couldn't lower a doctor down the city walls. Who knows what the starving refugees would do once they got a doctor outside? Thus, the high-ranking officials replied, never mind, ignore them. They can't die. If they ask again, tell them the message has been sent through a request to request a response from the king. The king had deep, been deeply troubled by the Yongin matters and easily angered the past many days, and naturally no one really dared to bother him with such a small thing. The soldiers responded accordingly that the man, feeling relieved, thanked them profusely and thanked his majesty and knelt to kowtow multiple times. Yet hours upon hours passed, shadows under the scorching sun moved from one into the other, but the asked for doctor still hadn't appeared and the temperature of that style, child in their arms was growing hotter. Will anyone come? Will anyone open the gates? Finally, they couldn't wait any longer and yelled to the towers, Officers, my apologies, but I want to ask, where's the doctor? We're waiting for a formal response to the king. Wait a while longer. They said that four hours ago, so why hasn't anyone come yet? Did they actually pass the message on to his majesty? They're not lying to us, are they? The father of the child could not wait any longer. He hardened his heart, tied the child to his back, and turned to his wife to say a last few words. The woman removed a protection charm from around her neck and put it around her husband's neck. The man ran towards the city wall and tried to scale it. The city wall was smooth, 
built to make climbing difficult, but after grabbing at it a few times, he still couldn't climb up. The rest of the men called out, let me help you, and they pushed him up. A crowd of ten-something men stacked themselves into a human pyramid, and they helped deliver him higher upon the wall. There, the man managed to grab onto the rope that had been used to lower water and food, and he continued to climb. At the bottom, hundreds of thousands watched anxiously, not daring to cheer for him, scared they might have been discovered. The soldiers on top of the towers had been standing watch for many days, and the young and refugees hadn't started anything, so they were fairly lax in their watch. It wasn't until that man had reached halfway that they noticed something, that someone was pressing close to the wall. What are you doing? No climbing. Climbers will be killed without mercy. Do you hear me? Climbers will be killed without mercy. I don't have any ill intentions. I just want to bring my child to the doctors. I won't do anything else. One of the superior officers was just having his meal, and upon hearing this became outraged. If that man was to scale the wall safely and set an example, many more young and refugees would attempt to do the same. He must be stopped. Don't you value your life? Go back down this instant. If you don't, you'll be sorry. Yet that man had already reached high on the wall, half past halfway, and with one more push, he'd be able to reach the top, so naturally he didn't stop. The superior officer never had anyone disobey him like this. His words were law. Whoever disobeys was easily was easily enough to take care of. However, he pulled out his sword and struck, and the rope snapped in two. With a snapped open hand, the man fell from midair. Amidst a thousand screaming, he landed heavily on the ground before the city gates. And that was the moment Sheila Yen arrived. The man had fallen on his backside down, and on his back was the child. Whoop! And the child was crushed into a clump of ground meat splaying blossoms of blood. That man's neck was broken, his eyes bulging, and around his twisted neck rolled a protection charm with the words Shanla written on it. Embroidered with golden threads, it was a protection charm from the Temple of the Crown Prince. The moment he started the climb, that man and his wife both held that protection charm in their hands and silently played for the, play, prayed for the blessings of His Highness the Crown Prince, which was how Shelian heard their voices and rushed over. Nevertheless, he was not a hero from any of those legends written in books and could in no way appear right before the executioner dropped their axes and saved lives under knives. The woman didn't even have the courage to flip her husband's dead body to check on the condition of her son. She covered her face and screamed, and without looking, she dashed, dashed forward madly and bashed her head against the wall. Crack, and she dropped dead, her body limp. Right before she Lian's eyes, in the flash of a second, three dead bodies piled before the city gates of the royal capital. He hadn't the time to react before the crowd were riled up, unable to hold back any longer. Dead a family of three all dead. Look at the good old officer working for his majesty. He won't save us, but instead is forcing our deaths. You won't let us in, but you won't let anyone out either. What should we have done? Three bloody lives are now in your hands. You said to expel all young and refugees from the capital, but how come I don't see any of the rich ones expelled? So us, the poor and powerless, deserve to die? I've seen through you. I can't stand it anymore. I really can't. Year after year, we paid our taxes, but now there's a disaster. Where did all the money go? Rather than aiding disaster victims, did all the money go to parasites and building your son's temples? Did this bit of food and rations, you did just this bit of food and rations to shut us up? What do you take us for, useless king, incompetent king? The soldiers on top of the tower were yelling at the crowd for them to stop. But that officer had seen much in his lifetime and didn't take any of it seriously. The situation was slowly getting out of control. Thousands and hundreds of thousands pushed furiously against the gate, some even using their heads and bodies to slam, and this time it wasn't a mere ants on trees. The gates moved. In fact, the entire fortress wall and the towers were slightly shaking. Ever since Shelian was born, he had never witnessed a situation such as this. The people he'd met had all been kind, peaceful, happy, satisfied, and endearing. Those twisted faces crying and screaming forced him to enter a completely foreign world and he couldn't help but feel cold in his bones. Even against the most horrifying ghosts and demons, he had never felt this way. Just then there was an angry roar from above. 
He whipped his head around and saw a tall and gaunt silhouette choking that officer who had cut the rope and caused the three deaths below the city walls. There was a loud and clear crack and his neck was broken. The band of soldiers had no idea that man had suddenly appeared and were all shocked and bewildered. They rushed forward with swords in their hands to surround him. Who are you? How did you get up here? Shilian immediately noticed the man's hands. They were smeared with blood and ripped flesh. That man had scaled the creviceless wall using his bare hands. When the figure turned around, it was Long Ying. He was calm and collected even when surrounded by soldiers. He crest, crossed over the parapet, threw the corpse of that officer down, and himself jumped off, stepping onto the corpse and using it as a stepping stone to break his fall. The moment when he jumped, he looked straight at Xilin, but what he was looking at wasn't Xilin. Instead, he looked through him to gaze at the royal palace, sitting right at the center of the royal capital. From that day onwards, the entire kingdom of Shanla was thrown into chaos. Oh! Oh! Okay! Holy shit! Well, that was brutal. <laughs> we don't even have the white calamity yet. We don't even have it. And it's already, it's already a mess. Oh my God. Mm -mm -mm. I don't like this cotton. I don't like where this is headed. No, no. Ah, uh, man, Long Ying. Lots of theories about him. Lots of theories about that Yang Ling. Man, okay. Okay. I, I, ooh. There's a lot of things going on in this story that I feel like are going to come back later. <laughs> As we go, I feel like these chapters are setting up lots of little things that are going to come back later and even later on in the story, way beyond the flashback. So mm, there's, there's some interesting things here. There were no pictures, sadly, with this group of chapters. And also I've re-decided what I'm going to do for next week um, because as I was, uh, Anime Annie sent me a list without um, spoiling the titles of the chapters. She sent me a list on, on Discord of all of the different chapters and the pages and she blurred out what the titles of the chapters are, so I won't be spoiled, so thank you. <laughs> but I was, when I was going back through and thinking about what I said at the beginning, I said that next week I was gonna look at chapters 77 and 78, which was pages 91 through 112, and I was like, that's not really a lot. And so I've altered one thing. Next week I'm gonna look at chapters 77 through 79, which is pages 91 to 126, which will mean that the following week, I'll look at chapters 80 through 83, which will be pages 127 to 162. That sounds a lot better. That sounds a lot better. So yeah, so I am looking, because I was I started the discussion, I was like, I'm only looking at two chapters next week with all this craziness going on. Mm -mm. So I made it three. So I'm gonna be looking at chapters 77 through 79 next week and just see what we get there. But, huh. and then hopefully uh, chapter 87, The Man Wall will be out by then and we can balance the insanity happening with something a little more calming. <laughs> like Sheely and showing up in Hua Chung's lap. <laughs> but oh my God, I just, I just, there's a lot at work in these chapters. A lot of work at these chapters and lots of different things being set up. Our poor boy, Shilian is, he's getting a taste of the ringer. He's not gone through the ringer yet. No, no. I think that is still yet to come uh, down the road, but, but he thinks that he's going through the ringer and it's like, well, maybe you are. <laughs> maybe you are. I don't know. But let's talk about this. I want to put on here as we go through different things, because there's a lot happening in these chapters. So in chapter 74, Fu Xing, and I do like that we start out a little bit lighthearted before things go to hell in a handbasket, where Feng Xin and Mu Qing, they're kind of making fun of Xili, and they're like, oh, you told Hua Chong that he could live for you? It seems kind of a little bit, a little bit flirty there. You're telling him he can live for you? And then, and then Xili realizes what he said, and he's like, I, I didn't mean it like that. It's like, I like the inadvertently Inadvertently, Feng Shen and Mu Qing are making fun of Xi Lian because he, his words seem like they could be kind of taken flir flirtatiously, but you know, Hong Hong is like 13, he's a little kid, and Xi Lian's 20. And it's hilarious because I wonder, will Feng Shen and Mu Qing ever realize 
that Hong Hong Air and Hua Chong are the same being. Because if they do, that's going to be freaking hilarious. They're going to be like, oh my God. Like the shenanigans that could take place. I get, I'm so excited to go through the story because what's fun about this flashback is that we're seeing Mu Ching and Feng Shen and Hua Chong and Shi Lian in the past and we know them 800 years later and I feel like all the stuff being set up here is going to impact later on and it's going to be a lot of fun and so I'm like I'm very very excited to see where that goes and to see possibly the four of these characters interacting in the present based on what we've seen in them in the past. So that's going to be exciting if we get to that, right? But Shilin gets embarrassed and Hua Chong eats off of the plate. He finally eats and, and Shilin likes that. He's like, look, he's like, he wasn't eating, he was starving and now he's eating off the plate. See, isn't that great? And Mu Ching and Functions are like, it's only because you're a heavenly official and you convinced him to. And, and Shilin's like, yeah, yeah, I know, <laughs> right? He's like, I get it. But Hua Chong seems to be in a better place and Shilin offers to um to go to Hua Chong to help find what does he say here? When I put on my notes, Shilin offers to go to Hua Chong to find help to get um to get water. Okay, the Heavenly Court, not Hua Chong. I put H C down in my notes. I'm like that's Heavenly Court, not Hua Chong. He could go to Heaven Hua Chong, but I doubt at this point he would be much help. But yeah, so Shilin tells Mu Ching that he's gonna go to the Heavenly Court and get help. And Mu Ching, I like that Mu Ching this entire time. This entire story, what's fascinating is you would think that because Mu Ching came from like a poor upbringing and came from the slums, you would think Mu Ching would be the one to be like, yeah, go get help, help these people out. But oddly enough, Mu Ching is like the most pragmatic and the most, he's like, no. And I think it's because Mu Ching can see that it's not going to make a difference. I think Mu Ching is a realist enough to know that this is not going to work and he's not getting his hopes up. And he doesn't want Shilian to get his hopes up either. And so he notes, he's like, hey, yeah, there's a problem with that. You've got to go get water from somewhere else. What if the heavenly officials of those kingdoms find out and they don't like it? They're going to be mad at you and it's going to cause a big problem. And Shilian's like, I got this. He's like, I am going to go to the heavenly court and try to like just get some support. And Function supports him. He's like, do what you got to do. Go ahead. We support you. And Mu Ching's like... I'm being cautious, but okay, you you go try to do your very best. And so the ones controlling the water in the Heavenly Court have conveniently left. Let's just talk about this. The Heavenly Court. I The funny thing is that Xi Lian brings up Wu, uh, Jun Wu at the very end. He brings up Jun Wu at the very end of, I think, Chapter 76, saying that Jun Wu theoretically could be the one powerful enough to take water from Yu Xi to Yongin and not get tired out. But Shi Lian says, well, Jun Wu has this big giant set of kingdoms to look for. Shan Lo is just like a little blip on his map. He probably has bigger fish to fry. And I'm like, yes, but also Jun Wu would not do that because he'd be in the same boat as everybody else. He'd be like, no, you don't need to get involved. That's not how this works. So Shi Lian is putting a little bit more faith in Jun Wu at this point in the story being like, oh, he would help if he could, but he's got much bigger problems. I'm like, he would not help you because he would be like Mu Ching and be like, we should not be doing this. But Shilian doesn't know that. So I'll make a note about the Heavenly Court. And the Heavenly Court, they know what's going on. They know that Shanla is drying up. They know that. And they're not helping. No, they... Like all of the water using, all the water using Henley officials, with the exception of the Rainmaster, they all go into hiding from Shilian. They all leave him. And it's kind of crazy. They were like, mm -mm, we're not helping you. No, they don't want to get involved with that because they know that that's not, that's not what they should be doing. And so it's interesting that the Rainmaster is somehow injured. We don't know how, but the Rainmaster's still around, right? The Rainmaster is around and somehow injured. Which, granted, we find out in earlier on in the story that there can be ghosts injured. Like, the Earthmaster was injured by Hua Chong, so they could have fought a ghost and become injured. And it doesn't seem like they make a point of saying the Rainmaster does not nearly have the amount of devotees that Shi Lian does. So the Rainmaster's not very strong, they, they make note of saying that he is not as strong 
as Shi Lian. So the fact that he's weaker could point to the fact of him getting injured, which is curious, um, which is fascinating and makes sense because he's just he's a he's a god of rain. It's not like he's not a martial god. He doesn't go around fighting ghosts. So him getting injured does make a lot of sense. That that part does make sense. And so then we have Nam Ji, which I would like in my head. I was thinking, I'm gonna put this over here. It's like little miscellaneous things. Nam Gong Ji, I don't want you to answer this question for me. Please do not answer. But I'm gonna guess that it is either Ling Wen when she was in the middle court or is a predecessor to Ling Wen. Or was just one in the middle court, but I think it's Ling Wen. I don't want to know for sure. I don't want confirmation. It just seems like in the chapter reading it the first time, I was like, oh, that's someone that's like the, the Ling Wen before. And then when I went back and took notes, I was like, or it's Ling Wen before she like, you know, advanced up into the upper court. So I don't want answers. I don't want confirmation or deconfirmation. We'll just let that sit there for a little while and just let it be known. But she, uh, she Lian makes the note that he didn't ever bring a, he didn't bring a salutations gift to any of the other heavenly officials when he ascended because he didn't think it was necessary. She Lian, make a note here, put up here. She Lian, uh, never, never gifted any of the heavenly officials. The Windmaster would not be proud of Shelian at this moment. The Windmaster's like, oh, you always bring a welcoming gift to all the heavenly officials when you ascend. Don't you know that? Like, I just I just imagine the Windmaster being like, Shelian. <laughs> like, Shelian is literally Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Does not care about the other townsfolk. Doesn't care about any of them. Shelian's just sitting there reading his books, practicing with his swords. Doesn't care about anybody else. Minds his own business. But he doesn't play the political game. And the Windmaster has told him in the past, being like, you gotta play the political game. But the Windmaster wasn't around 800 years ago to tell him this. And so now Shelian's kind of embarrassed because he's like, man, I need to give the Windmaster a gift. But now it looks pretty obviously like a bribe. <laughs> so he's like, ugh. He's like, maybe I should have done this before. But Nong Gong says that the Rainmaster is kind of a hermit and keeps to themselves and doesn't really want anything. Which I kind of wondered if Shi Lian took inspiration from the Rainmaster in the 800 years since uh, Shanla's fall. And the reason I say that is because when he goes to visit the Rainmaster's domain, it kind of reminded me of the, the Poochie Shrine. Kind of reminded me of there. It's just like this little lush farming village in Yushi. It's just like this really quiet place. Like you enter the little barrier into his domain and instead of these big magnificent palaces, it's like a little shack. And there's just like people, like the farmers are his subordinates. It's just this quiet, quaint little village. Nothing out of the ordinary, nothing fancy. And they established that the Rainmaster was royalty. They say that the Rainmaster was royalty. Which makes me wonder if he kind of learned the same lesson that Shi Lian is going to learn. And the Rainmaster was like, I don't want to live this grandiose lifestyle anymore. I just want to go do my own thing and kind of be a hermit and not be in anybody's way. And I feel like Shi Lian kind of takes a page from that book being like, oh yeah, I don't need all this stuff. It seems like the Rainmaster and Shi Lian have similar personalities. It seems like the Rainmaster doesn't put on airs and neither does Shi Lian. And Shi Lian kind of takes a page from that book and is like, oh, well, maybe he doesn't need a gift then because I wouldn't want it. He says that he knew that the Rainmaster was royalty, but he didn't bring any gems or jewels to offer him because he thought the Rainmaster would be like him and kind of had disdain for those sort of things. So I find that interesting, right? I, I feel like Shi Lian may end up modeling his own thing in the shrine and stuff after the Rainmaster, oddly enough. Um, seeing it, that he, he gets a little bit more humble afterwards, if that makes sense. But, okay, the oxen that turns into the farmer is pretty cool. Like, the oxen, like, stands up and turns into this buff, manly, manly uh, subordinate. I think that's the Rainmaster. I think the oxen is the Rainmaster. He's just like pulling the wool over Shi Lian's eyes. He's like, oh no, the Rainmaster's injured, doesn't want to see anybody. I feel like the Rainmaster is the oxen. It would make sense because he's just, he just wants to live this humble existence. Doesn't have to worry about anything. 
And he had the hat. And he had the bamboo hat. And I'm like, come on. What kind of deity would just leave his most divine item with a random subordinate that turns into an oxen? No, I'm pretty sure the oxen is the rain master. He says he doesn't like to meet people. And Shelian, and he's like, oh, are you the 17-year-old that ascended? And Shelian says, regrettably so. Like, Shelian is starting to realize, yeah, maybe I did ascend too early. Maybe the Goshi was right. Mm. And so, and I like that the remaster says, don't say regrettably, it's the truth. Like, it's just what it is, right? And so, the oxen, the oxen uh, man notes that all of the heavenly realm, they know about Shanla. And they're not doing anything. They are, as he says, enjoying the show. Yep. They're just waiting for it to fall. They don't care. And they're just like, look at this guy running around thinking he can do something. Ugh, it's pretty creepy. It's pretty sad. But you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when Sean, when Chi Lian was about to fight Lon Chan Chu and everybody was like, fight, let him fight, come on. And then they got upset when there wasn't a fight. These, these heavenly officials are all once human. They're just like, look at this. Look at this kingdom fall. Oh, isn't that funny? And it kind of, it, what sucks about it is that we understand why they can't take any positions at this point because it's not going to help the matter. But it also kind of sucks that instead of feeling bad for the situation, they're just sitting back like munching on popcorn, enjoying it. And I'm like, people are dying. And y'all are just like, well, isn't that funny? Ha ha ha. Rather than just being like sad about it. That's the thing that's kind of creepy. And so Shi Lian, he's like, oh, I wonder if I, and Shi Lian, out of, of that story, what he takes away from it is he's like, I wonder if I should have really given them a gift. And I'm like, I don't think that would have mattered. I think Shelian could have gave him a ton of jewelry and everything and gotten out of their good side and it would not have changed anything. They still would have said no and wouldn't have helped. But the Rain Master decides he's going to lend. He says, well, I could lend you this hat. It just depends on my mood. And Shelian's like, what? He's like, if I lend you the hat, it's an act of kindness. If I don't, it's an act of duty. The Rain Master says, I'm fine either way. Like, you're the one prostrating yourself asking for this hat. Like, you're the one that's going to get in trouble for asking me for it. He's like, if I give it away, I'll just say I was being kind and that you should have known not to use it. But if I don't, I'm not going to get in trouble either because it was an act of duty. So the Rain Master's like, I have nothing to lose by either giving you this hat or not giving you this hat. It just depends on how I feel today. And Shilian kind of gets angry about that because he gets what he's saying, but he's still a little proud. And he's like, no, he's like, well, I'm so desperate. I would offer up all of my temples to you. All of my temples, and I would kowtow to you a hundred times to get that hat. And he's like, geez, okay, you don't have to get that crazy. And he's like, it's that serious to Shi Lian. And the Rain Master's hat is a bamboo hat, which to me seems like the hat that Shi Lian wears on his head when he goes traveling. So I don't, I'm not saying that that hat on his head is the same hat that the Rain Master gave him, but if Shi Lian fashioned himself a hat that reminded him of, which would fit Shi Lian being like self-torturing and like just a masochist self-harming himself if he wore a hat that reminded him of his mistakes with Yongin and Shanla, that would check out with Shi Lian's character. Of course it would. Of course it would. And so, but he gets the bamboo hat and then... And the Rain Master warns him, he's like, you know, other countries, this hat doesn't create water. It just lets you carry water from one area to another. So you will have to take water from somewhere else. And those countries might not be willing. You might get on some, you know, heavenly officials' bad sides if you steal their water. So you can take here from Yushi. We've got a ton of water. You can take from here. But he makes the same thing that Feng Shin says, where distant waters do not put out nearby fires. He's like, you're not going to, it's not going to work. You can take all you want from here, but don't break my hat. I'll never forgive you. And I'm like, that seems like a red flag of foreshadowing. Uh, he says, don't break my hat. And he says that you can take water from here, but it's not going to solve your problem. Because again, it's going to take so long to get from there and back. But Shi Lian, he just, he ladles the water from the south and brings it there to, to Yongin to, to create some rain. But it just goes like, it's just a shower. And Shi Lian's like, all that work for... Not a lot. Hmm. And then Muqing shows up because Muqing is the bearer of bad news. 
And Ruching shows up and says that it's been taking Shili and he's like, do you know how long you've been gone? And surprising no one, Shili did not think about that. He was like, I was just so busy, I didn't think about it. But it takes him five to six days to get water to Yongin. That's a lot. That's a lot of days. And Mu Ching is mad because he's like, you've not been answering your prayers. They're mounting up. Function and I have handled all we can handle, but you, we don't have the authorization to answer some of these prayers. You need to come back and do that. It's getting crazy. You're shirking your duties to go help this, and it's not really doing anything. And I feel like I do agree at this point with Mu Ching where he's like, look, you're wasting all this time dragging this water over that's not having as much of an effect when you've got matters you're supposed to be doing for your job that you're not doing. That's taking up your, that this is taking up too much time. And I totally get that. I mean, I had, I had a friend at work that asked me, a colleague asked me to do a task for them. And it was a task that was not part of my job description, but I was like, okay, I'll do it. But it ended up taking a lot more time than I anticipated. And it was starting to get to the point where I couldn't do my job because I was worried about this other task. And I eventually had to like put it to the side and be like, I'll handle that later. Got to take care of this first. So that's kind of the same boat that Shi Lian is in. Mu Ching's like, you need to focus on what's your job and then this other stuff can wait, right? And so he notes to Shi Lian that while you've been gone, there's already been riots breaking out in the capital from the men of Yongin. And so I thought it was interesting to talk about the men of Yongin. So talk about Yongin, Yongin and Shanla. That the men in the riots were shackled at their hands and necks. Kind of like Shi Lian with his power being shackled. It's kind of the same area, right? All the Shi Lian also had his ankles as well. Now, at this point, uh, in the actual book, they also say that there was, um, what did they say there was? They, they had a specific name for it. They said that it was called a, a kongu. A kongu, a flat board usually made of wood that was secured around the neck and sometimes hands of people as a form of corporal punishment and public humiliation. So it's kind of like they had these in medieval times too in the West where it was like you had the board over your head and over your hands and it kind of just kept you in this and it made you look awful and it was really uncomfortable and hurt. And that's what they've had as well. But the people, it shows how the people in the riots, all this started when the people started migrating in. The refugees were trying to find a place to live. But they established the capital's already pretty full. There's a lot of people living in the capital. It's kind of crowded to begin with. So they found this field that was open to settle in and thought, okay, there's this open field. Nobody's here. Nobody owns it. We'll just build our houses here and be fine. Cool. Great. The problem was that the field that they were settling in was the recreation field was the recreation area for the other people of Shanla. Which, again, you got that, you got that argument, like, you know, you have this argument where you have this space that these people could be in and could live, but the rich people are like, no, they're just, they're, it's like, you know, the argument the rich people are like, oh, the poor people are moving to our neck of the city and they're, they're driving down the property value. And it's like, they're just trying to live, you know? So it's that big argument, right? But the people there were getting really frustrated and it doesn't help the fact that they say that the people from Yongin have a very distinct accent. So they're very noticeable. So there's automatically that air of discrimination there because they're easy to discriminate against because they're not like us. They are an other, right? They don't get our ways, right? And they're noticeable. So then the whole thing, the whole riot starts because of a dog. I do know that there are several in Eastern countries that eat dogs. Uh, in the U.S., we do not eat dogs. Dogs are not a form of food in the U.S., and neither are horses, really. But I know in other countries, they are. Uh, I had a friend that he lived in South Korea for uh, a good few years and noted that they ate some over there. And he was just like, no, no, thank you. But that that's a cultural thing, right? But the whole thing started because they suspected that they knew that a boy 
supposedly had stole a duck from a family to eat and they suspected suspected it was the same deal with the dog. Now, Feng Shen notes that he doesn't think that they're lying. He thinks that the people of Yongin did not steal a dog. Feng Shen's like, well, it doesn't seem like they're lying. I don't think they really stole it. But the damage has already been done. There's already been enough people convicting while Xi Lian wasn't there. The damage is already done. And the soldiers make the Yongin people kneel. He makes the Yongin people kneel as fruit, eggs, and lettuce are thrown at them. Which, you know what? That's so sad. You know why? I mean, on the one hand, you could argue, well, it's better than rocks. True. But the sad thing is the people of Yongin have been starving and going there to get food and shelter. And what do you throw at them? food that they could eat, you know? So it's like, it's so wasteful. They're just wasting all this food, throwing it at them and those people need it to survive. And it's like, damn it, that sucks. But the older men kind of, the older men of Yongin kind of know what the end of the story is going to be if they don't get things settled and they try to apologize. But then Long Ying, Long Ying, let's put him over here. Oh, Long Ying. He has become quite a character in this, right? Quite a character, oh, Long Ying has. It's kind of crazy. But Long Ying, he's one, one of the rioters. So establishing that Yang Ling, that Long Ying has this sense of justice about him. Which has been kind of set up from the beginning when he showed up at the temple when his son had died. It was kind of set up, but... At the time, in those chapters, there was kind of an air of innocence about Long Ying, that he was just a father whose son had died on the way there, and he was just innocently looking at the pond of coins like, hey, why don't we do something with this? And he wanted to see the king, but he wasn't granted that audience. Now, in this set of chapters, it's escalated a little bit, and it's like, oh, no, he's one of the rioters that has this big sense of justice about him being like, you all aren't being fair, right? And I like that it basically implies, Long Ying implies that the people of Shanla are just using the Yongins as scapegoats. He's like, hey, he's like, you know, back, you know, he's like, did you see the person steal the dog? And they were like, well, no, but there's been more crime since you all have moved in here. So it must be you. And he's like, oh, I see. He's like, so basically you're only, you're, you're basically convicting us of the crimes because we're an easy scapegoat before you were committing the crimes, but now you've found somebody to place the blame on. So you're just going to do that. Right. And he's not wrong necessarily, but then that image of the persimmon, the persimmon thrown at his lips, at his mouth, looking like he'd vomited a bloody blossom. Mm, I don't know. So, okay, okay, so I have theories about Long Ying. I have theories about him. I, at this point, it kind of goes three ways. And again, I'm going to, this is, this is Romania Black's crackpot theories that I don't want confirmation or deconfirmation on. You all can sit there, take your mugs of tea and go, ha, 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 and cackle at me. And how wrong I probably am until I find out what the answer is. But I have three theories. One, I said back in the past that he becomes the Blackwater ghost. That he ends up dying and becomes the Blackwater supreme ghost. I still think that's a possibility. Still think it's a possibility. There's a lot of water ties to him. And they made the comment uh, whenever Shilin was atop the parapet that the people, the people of Yong and down below look like a black wave. And I was like, okay, that's tying to black water. All right. Okay. Tying to this and, and longing seems to be the leader of them. So that very well could be. All right. Uh, also, could he be the white calamity? I thought about this. I'm like, could he end up being, I think this is the least likely. And when I give you my third answer, I think it's more towards this one or the third answer. But could he be the white calamity that that wishes ill upon that wishes ill upon all of Shanla because they established when Shilian like when he took a swing at Shilian, Shilian was like, oh, this guy's really strong. 
Ugh. And so he could become this really strong ghost. But I don't, I don't think that's it though. Because the White Calamity seems like they were a very strong ghost to begin with. And I feel like to become a Supreme, it takes time to become a Supreme. Time and energy and gathering all of, and battling and getting stronger and stronger. I don't feel like Long Ying could instantly become the White Calamity and become Bai Wusheng and be that powerful that quickly. Unless all the people of Yongin supported him. Maybe, but I don't think that's the case. My other option is, because it showed that Long Ying jumped down off of the, the, the gate to go back down with the Yongin people, right? My other thing is that maybe Long Ying, much like Anla did with Qi Rong, Long Ying maybe, maybe strikes... Let me get this right here. I almost said befriended, but that's not really a good word for it. Strikes up a deal with the White Calamity. Maybe the White Calamity approaches Long Ying and is like, you are really strong. I want to use you to help me get revenge on the capital and the people of Shanla. Will you help me do that? And Long Ying will be like, yeah, I will. At this point, yes, I will help you take down the capital. So I don't think that Long Ying becomes the White Calamity. I think that the I think it'd be the the timeline doesn't quite match up that. I think he could become the Blackwater. I think Long Ling could become the Blackwater. But I also think that maybe because we know the White Calamity is coming. It's been three years. It's just been a matter of time. Would MXTX make the White Calamity come at the worst possible time in this story? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, she would. And so I feel like maybe Long Ying is approached by the White Calamity being like, you are somebody I could use. You want to help me? And he'll be like, I have nothing to lose at this point. Sure. Because he tells, I missed it in the reaction. I missed this line in the reaction that Shilian, he softens the rocks that are attacking them, which good for Shilian. And he appears in front of Long Ying as the cultivator that he appeared of before. And he's like, man, he's really strong. And he asks... I, miss, I skipped over this line when I was reading, and then when I went back to take notes, I saw it. But he asks Long Ying why he didn't take the pearl. He's like, you still have the pearl, right? Why didn't you take it to Yongin? And Long Ying says, my son is here. I'm here. It's like, there's nothing left for me in Yongin. It's like, you know, you get the impression that his wife is dead. He's like, I'm not leaving my son. I buried him here. I'm not leaving him till I die. Hmm. And then he, he offers the he offers the pearl back to Shilian and Shilian sees the shackle marks on his hand and he's like, I'm not taking that back. It's like, no. And then he's like, you should take it and go to Yongin. And he says, there's no going back. He's like, no, there's nothing for me there. Like, like Long Ying has realized the writing on the wall. There's nothing waiting for him back at back there at Yongin. He's like, I need to stay here. And my son's buried here, so I'm gonna stay here until I die. So I don't know. I I can instantly see him striking up a deal with the White Calamity because the White Calamity, I mean, he has nothing to lose. There's no going back. And that moment he jumped off the parapet and looked through Shilian to see the capital as he's falling. It's like, no, he's going to take down the capital. He's going to take it down. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But I don't think he's the White Calamity. The White Calamity also looks like from what we've seen in the images and from what we've seen from the Donghua, he seems a lot more like... The White Calamity in the creepiest way seems very frail and kind of almost like, like a hollow bird. Like kind of like a bird. It's very like hollow and majestic and serene. And Long Ying is like, seems like a big burly guy. So I don't think they match up in terms of that. But so I think he's either going to help the White Calamity or he's going to become the Black Water later. One of those two, but we'll see. We'll see. And so Shi Lian, for the first time in his life, he talked about how powerless he feels. He's like, I, he's like, I don't know what to do. He's like, I've always been in a place and kind of like we talked about before the reaction. He's like, I've always been in a place where I could do something. And now I can't. He's like, he feels like he's powerless in this cycle as the king, as the king declares that the people of Yongin have to leave and they're banned. He gives them some expenses to go up elsewhere and shuts the capital gates because it's getting out of hand. And that leads us to chapter 76, which... The moment they gave us a trigger warning for violence, I was like, we've had some a lot of violence so far in this. Why are we having a trigger warning? I, mm, there's no way. There's no way. I don't know how the oh. Dong is going to do it. 
I'm like that a child yeah. death. Mm -mm. Unless they just show it happening and they don't show us the aftermath or describe it like it's described in this book. I'm like, oh my God, like that, just that visual, it's like seared into my brain now and I can't get it out. It's like, thanks MXTX. I didn't think on a Sunday night I needed that imagery in my head, but thank you. But yeah, so the people, so the king gave them some food, water, and some expenses to go elsewhere, to go to the far east. But the people of, and I get why they don't leave. I get why the people of Yongin don't leave because they're like, we, the people that were already there, I'm assuming the ones that do leave. So they're given food, water, and a little bit of money to go further east, to go around the gates and go further east and to see if they can find somewhere else. I imagine the ones that did leave were the ones that were from the capital had been there that had enough energy that they're like, okay, let's just go and see what happens, right? But the people that are coming there from Yongin that have traveled hundreds of miles and arrive at the gates only to see them closed and that are exhausted and they say have been carrying stretchers and like babies on their backs and they're dead, yeah, I could see why they would get there and not want to go. Because they're like, we just spent all this time getting here and now you're going to tell us to go elsewhere. It felt very, if you want me to, to describe it as something, it felt very Grapes of Wrath. Have you ever read John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath? It felt a lot like that. In fact, there are two Steinbeck stories that this chapter reminded me of. One is the Grapes of Wrath. And in that, um, it takes place during the Depression, during the Dust Bowl era in the United States. And this family, without spoiling anything, this family decides to travel from the east of the United States to the west. So kind of going the opposite way. And then they get to the west and find out that things like with Yongin and the capital are quite complicated. So th there's a big similarity there with that story. But um, the other story, we'll get to that and how it's similar. But yeah, so the people, they don't want to leave. So they just, they're just sitting around like hoping that the king will change his mind. And the soldiers are like, nah, we're going to wait them out. We're going to wait them out and eventually they're going to leave or they're going to die. One of the two. And that imagery, that imagery of Shilian on top of the parapet with his white robes fluttering, I want to see that in Dong Wa so badly. I want to see it because it'll be such a beautiful imagery and Shilian just looking down at them, at the people. And he goes back to the story that he remembers as a kid where he was looking down at a pile of ants on the ground and he wanted to take his finger and touch the ants and the attendant stops him and says, oh, don't touch them, they're dirty. Kind of like, you know, the situation here. And the attendant takes her foot and stomps on the ants like they're nothing. And then Shelian makes the comment that they didn't seem like they were a lot to begin with. And then after she stomped on them, they were nothing at all. So it seems like that is the idea that they're going to do. They're going to wait out. They're going to wait out the refugees. And they'll either leave or they'll die. And if in either way, then they won't be a problem. They won't be a problem to Shanla anymore. But people are not ants and they're a lot more resilient than that, right? And so I love that Shelian is commenting that there is a wall separating these two worlds. You have on one side of the wall, the people of Shanla like playing music, probably playing music loudly so they can't hear the refugees. They're just playing it louder to drown them out with all this culture and everything. And then you have the people on the other side of the wall that are dying slowly. And just the differences between them. And it's very, very real, right? And Mu Ching. Shi Lian makes the comedy. He's like, what about the women and children? Couldn't we take them back? And Mu Ching's like, no. He's like, you want to treat people equally? This is, we have to treat people equally in this situation. He's like, we can't leave the women and children here. The men won't leave without their wife and children. They'll still stay there. That doesn't solve the problem. And plus, if we let some in and some not, then they're going to be like, well, why them? Why not us? And so Mu Ching's like, no, you can't do that. You have to keep this equal. And I like that function always says you think too much, Mu Ching. And Mu Ching's like, what do I do with this? I like that. But the soldiers are just basically going to wait them out. And so the fifth day is when the problem arises. This goes on for five days. And then the problem happens that causes the whole thing. And so Shi Lian, Shi Lian is trying to sort his days into thirds. I'm like, Shi Lian, honey, he's spreading himself too thin. He spends a third of the day answering his devotee prayers. He spends a third of the day 
tending to the people of Yongin. And he spends a third of the day trying to get water. And no offense, but that's not solving anything. He's not going to get anything accomplished that way. He's not going to be able to bring water. He can't tend to all of them. He can't tend. He's just stretched himself too thin. He can't do it all, right? He's. And I love that idea that he says that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He can only do so much. And so all of this stuff goes down while he's not there. The stuff on the wall goes down while he's doing one of the other things, right? And what this reminded me of was the scene with the, the man and the wife and the son. It reminds me of another Steinbeck story, which is called The Pearl. I read it a few weeks ago. My, my coworker loaned it to me. It's only like 90 pages. It's amazing. I was like, if you get a chance to go read any Western book, it's 90 pages. It's a very quick read. I read it in a day and I was like, Ugh. but I was gushing about it. It's called The Pearl by John Steinbeck. It's a really, really sad really really good story but if you like this jam if this stuff and all these like complicated theories and ideas about about morality and wealth and everything in the wealth gap if that's your jam then you should read the pearl by john steinbeck but without spoiling anything the story starts in the pearl with a man and a woman who are impoverished and their son is sick and they go to a wealthy doctor to try to get them to help him and he basically says no and that's where the story starts and I won't spoil it for you from there because it's really, really good. But yeah, this this family needs a doctor. And the soldiers, they're just so apathetic. They're like, oh, just give him some food and water. And I'm like, no, he's, he needs more than that. He needs medicine. And so they ask if they can get a doctor. And they were like, well, no, we don't want to hoist a doctor down there. We can't do that. No. And they can't open the gates because if they open the gates a little bit, everybody's going to rush in. So they're like, no, we just can't do it. We can't help you in any way. So they lie to the people and they tell them that they're going to tell the king. They're like, well, we'll just go tell the king and we'll let you know what he says. But they don't tell the king. That's the thing. The, the soldiers, the soldiers never tell Shelian or the king about the issue. Because their rationale is the king is really frustrated with everything going on and he's very stressed and so they're like, we're not going to tie, we're not going to tell him. We're not going to get in trouble for giving him a trivial matter of one person being a doctor for their kid. Mm -mm. So the father ends up becoming very frustrated and he's like, fine, I'm going to strap my kid to my back, climb up there and get them to take my kid to a doctor and do it that way. So he manages, and I just can picture like all the people forming this human pyramid to let him get up to go to the rope that was hanging to give him the food. And he climbs up the rope to the top. And he's almost there when the soldier warns him. He's like, either get down or I'm going to cut you down. And he's like, I can't. My son's dying. I need you to help. And they're like, we told you. We told the king. And he's like, well, it's been over four hours. He's not answered back yet. And then they cut the rope. And Shelian arrives right as they're... And for a second, I thought Shelian was going to like... I thought Shilian was going to pull like a thing with Hong and jump down to save him. But he doesn't make it in time. And the man lands on his back. With the kid on his back. And that's it. And then him and the kid are dead. And the way that she describes it in the book, it's disturbing. And what's even more disturbing is that the wife, like, just kills herself then and there. She just smashes her head into the wall. Like that. And what makes Shelian feel all the worse is that the protection charm she gave him said Shanla on it. And it was from his temple. Like the charm was from his temple. Meaning that these three were not refugees that had just showed up from their long walk. They had been inside the capital long enough to go and get the protection charm and keep it on them. And then they'd been kicked out. So, of course, it's going to make Shi Lian feel even worse that these are people that have been inside the capital where he, they had been to his temple and he couldn't protect them. And he'd heard their prayers and that's why he came running and he was too late. And so, and then everybody just gets a riot starts. And the ants that had once seemed so tiny, when all of them start to move together and smash against the gates and use their bodies, it starts to move the gates and to move the walls. And they don't seem so much like ants anymore. And that's when things start to get even worse. And Shelian comments that he's never seen this side of people before. Again, Shelian has always seen like, 
like the Daenerys as he's being lifted up, like the Mishra, he's always seen them like view him as like kind and considerate and seen them be happy and at peace. He's never seen people on the brink of on the brink of death willing to do anything out of desperation. And he's seeing that for the first time. And he said it scared him more than any ghost or demon. Yeah. Yeah, humans are scarier than any monster. Or they can be. And the funny thing is the monsters in the story were once human. So there you go. But the thing that gets me is at the very end here, the officer who killed the three of them, Long Ying climbed up. They established the wall as smooth. He climbed up using his fingers and scraped the flesh from his fingers to climb up to kill the officer. And it makes sense why. Because just like that dad had been trying to save his child and they both ended up dying Long Ying had come to the capital to save his son, and his son ended up dying too, and nobody cared. And so, of course, Long Ying is pissed, and that's why he gets mad and kills the officer, right? And he's so calm and cool when he does it. He's just so calm and collected, like, and the people come at him, and he just, he throws the corpse of the officer down and jumps off himself and uses it to break his fall. And then as, I love that visual of as he's jumping off, he looks through Shilian. He can't see Shilian, but he looks through him to look at the capital as he falls. Like, I'm going to tear you down. I think he's going to help the White Calamity or become the Blackwater. One of the two. I don't, I don't think he'll become the White Calamity. I just don't. But I wanted to throw it out there because it's on my mind. So I'm like, that's like a 5% chance. I'm like at, I'm like at 5% chance White Calamity. 45% chance he helps the White Calamity. 50% chance he becomes a Blackwater. That's where I'm at. That's my percentage of where I'm at right now. And maybe this volume will find out. But I, I am surprised to see that Long Ying is becoming like a very big prominent character in this series. And it makes sense now that Xilian, that name would stick around Xilian's head even if his CPU and his brain doesn't have room for it. And he's like, yeah, I'll just call you Bandage Boy Long Ying. No matter what, right? Interesting. But yeah, and from that point on, the kingdom was thrown into chaos. So yeah, these chapters were a lot. I just, I feel like it sets up, this. these chapters all set up the conflict between Yang and the capital and just furthering the whole complication of the crisis and Shilian just being spread too thin. Shilian is trying to do everything instead of just doing his job. He's like, no, I can save everyone. And instead it's just, no one's getting helped is the problem, right? And so, I, I don't know, y'all. I don't know. What do we do? Long Ying's interesting. I'm curious what we're going to see out of him because I feel like we've not seen the last of him at all. I feel like this is a start. And in the Heavenly Realm, knowing about all this, the bamboo hat, the forewarning, don't break my hat or I'll never forgive you. I'm curious. I'm curious, one, if the hat is the one Shilian keeps on his head. If that's it and he just doesn't use it in the future because he knows he's not supposed to and it doesn't make a difference. But he has to give it back to the Rain Master at some point, right? Right? So maybe the bamboo hat that Shilian wears is just in homage to that hat or a constant reminder to him of the Rain Master. I feel like we've not seen the last of the Rain Master at all. Um, we've not seen the last of Yat Long Ying. And now things are going to get crazier between the riots and the capital. Yay. And... I tell y'all, in the back of my mind, it's just, Bai Wu Sheng is there. It's just not happened yet. And I'm like, I'm very curious to know now, we've got all these riots and stuff going on. If, because here's the thing, the Heavenly Realm knows what's going on with Shanla. They know what's going on. They're just not doing anything. They're like just sitting back watching, being like, I guess we'll watch this kingdom fall. See what happens. The Ghost Realm should be able to do the same, right? Only the ghost realm doesn't look down at the mortal realm. They're in the same plane as the mortal realm. So I wonder if, if the White Calamity sees this kingdom in chaos and is like, time to go and take advantage of this dire moment and cause some calamity whilst I'm here. Hey, guys. I feel like that's the situation. I feel like the White Calamity is going to see the kingdom of Shanla in chaos and is like, okay, let's go do this. And Shilian's supposed to be the one to stop him because he's the martial god. He should be stopping the White Calamity. So what do we do with that? But yeah, so that's where we're at. So I am going to read chapter 77 through 79 uh, for next week. 
Uh, hopefully, I'm going to wait till Wednesday of this coming week before I even think about starting because hopefully by Wednesday, Chapter 87 of the Manwa will be released. So hopefully we'll see Chapter 87 of the Manwa next week. And if not, we'll wait till the next week if I record it too soon. But y'all, I don't know. I'm a little bit worried <laughs> about where the story is going. But I'm very curious to know your thoughts down below. Um, these were not fun chapters. <laughs> These were very sad chapters and very, very, like, ominous, foreboding chapters that I feel like will have lots of impact later on and are going to come back later on. And we'll be like, oh, that's what this meant when we get to it. So, but we'll see, right? I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> so in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yes... I'll be back next week with episodes or chapters 77 through 79 of Heaven Officials Blessing. Bye.